This episode is brought to you by Peak, the blockchain for real-world applications and home of DPIN. If you think it's time for Web3 to get real, check out their website at peak.network. That's P-E-A-Q dot network. Hello, everyone. It's Daniel from DPIN Hub over here. And today I'm super, super excited to have Andre from the project The Grass in our podcast. And Andre, thanks so much for joining. I've been actually uh, pretty, like a big fan of The Grass for many months now. And I've been super excited following the progress when it started and what it's going right now. Uh, but I'd like to first ask you like, to introduce yourself and tell us a, a little bit about the inspiration behind uh, the Grass. Uh, thanks for having me here, Daniel. Um, so Grass is actually the first oracle for decentralized AI. We actually set out you know, building this protocol with the initial vision of making web scraping more ethical. Uh, this is a problem that a lot of people aren't really that aware of, but there are companies out there unethically hijacking users' bandwidth and scraping the internet with it. Um, and most of these applications are actually being backdoored through free apps like VPNs and screensavers that people are just installing and, and not really understanding the risks of. Um, and you know, recently, as AI blew up, we realized that there is a much bigger problem to solve using the same technology. And the problem was of validating the origin of data sets. Something that a lot of people don't really notice is that web pages will return different data to centralized servers compared to the data that they send to human nodes. So if you try reading data from a website using a server, like on AWS, for instance, it'll give you different data than if you're just browsing it in your browser, right? And then after we spoke to a lot of AI engineers, we realized that there's actually a necessity for an Oracle that can tie the source of data to the data that a model is being trained on. And, and that's what we're working on right now. Wow. So that means that, uh, let's say I, I have a website, a big website. I don't want people to scrape the data. So I'm a specifically target uh, like IP addresses from AWS, from like servers that I know that they're not real people and I change the content. Is that it? Yeah, yeah, more or less. You know, a big fear that a lot of websites have is actually their competitors scraping them. In general, you know, if you're if you're selling running shoes and your competitor is also selling running shoes, you want to show a better price to users. But that being said, you don't want to show that price to your competitor who might be scraping your website with a server. So you're going to set up certain blocks or honeypots. And this is something we actually noticed while we were uh, playing around with GPT-4 uh, pretty recently, actually. They added this new web browsing feature, but they're using a data center to browse the web. So at the inference layer, when you're asking it things like, hey, where can I get the best price for this? Or where, where's the best place to look at this? It's actually returning incorrect data. It'll show, it'll give you a number that's wrong. Then you click on the link, your browser is showing you something completely different. Uh, and, and and this is, you know, when we tested the same thing using grass, we actually got 100% accuracy. Wow, that's insane. Yeah, I mean, I, I've done a little bit of playing around with web scraping in the past. And I can completely say that if you're trying to do from any kind of known servers, AWS, the Google Cloud servers, DigitalOcean, a lot of times things get blocked. And then you need to like, when you're working at home, you're trying your code and the code works. And then you deploy it to production and it stops working. And then I guess that's one of the reasons why. Can you tell me a little bit about how it's going to integrate with the, the deep in space, right? Like the decentralized networks and how uh, that thing works. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So there's actually a lot of great deep in solutions out there for data provenance, like Filecoin and Arweave. Um, and they solve a very important problem. But we're still left with this issue of trust, like I mentioned earlier. And this is where we come in, as we can indisputably verify the source of data as requests are being sent. We can actually see this being a big problem coming up uh, with the U.S. election next year. There's going to be all kinds of questions around how true is this data or did you really source this from there? And, you know, especially with the powerful AI models that currently exist and uh, you, you can imagine how many problems might arise when people are starting to feed false information to these models, both at you know the fine tuning level and also when, when it comes to just trading the base model. Yeah, that's uh, that's insane. I think that can make a lot of the advances of projects like uh, ChatGPT, for example, invalid for a lot of things, right? If you if imagine you ask something that's quite important to have a right answer and then things go wrong, who's the blame? If ChatGPT or like any other AI gives a wrong answer, who is the one to blame? Are right? you paying for a service? Is the, the service provider? Is the data that you're trying to extract wrong? That, I think there's a lot of new things, new problems that didn't exist before. They're going to start showing up now. And I think uh, and what you guys are building, it can really impact on that and having like good source of information. How does the incentive mechanism work on that sense? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. Fundamentally, we actually try our best to make this product not feel like a crypto product at all. So some people actually get surprised when they find out, hey, there's going to be this crypto incentive involved. And the way it works is actually as we send web requests through the current application, which is a web, uh, which is a browser extension. The extension is actually giving the sequencer proof of the request. 
And then as a sequencer is signing away a token in exchange for that proof of request, then like you can actually go and claim it uh, after you've sent that proof to a smart contract. At the moment, we're incentivizing uptime. Uh, and, you know, moving forward, as we come out of our beta phase, we will not be doing that anymore. It'll be only compensation for uh, actual web requests that are being routed. So I'd say right now is a really good time to join because all you need to do is have it open and uh, your extension doesn't have to do any work. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, it's been insane seeing the growth of, the, of this project going the last, I don't know, couple of months, exponential uh, growth, because a lot of people are getting excited about the the grass, the grass points, and how it's how it's going to work. Uh, and one thing that I, I, I struck me very beneficial for a lot of like deep in projects is how easy it's to onboard new users, right? Like you don't need to actually go out of your way and buy expensive hardware, climb on roofs. That plays a big role on on how fast the network can scale. Because at the end of the day, you really need scale for this to work, right? You need like different nodes in different parts of the world, uh, South America, Asia, the US, and, and et cetera. And I think in a matter of like a few months, you, you guys managed to, to achieve that. And it was like super, super impressive. And I'm really excited to see where it's going to go next. For example, for ChatGPT, do you have an idea how they script the information initially? Yeah, yeah, they use Bing servers. Yeah, they, they uh, OpenAI had actually published uh, an article displaying where most of the data sources were. Most of it was actually Reddit. And it was pretty funny to see Reddit start to block off access to its API and stuff like that. That's interesting that most of the data came from Reddit. That's wild because the, the stuff that you can see on Reddit can be all over the place, right? A lot of it was from Reddit. A lot of it came from other language sources, obviously, um, like uh, news articles and things like that. Reddit is particularly good because when you're training an LLM, you want question and answer data. And more importantly, some would say you need a human to go and rank all the answers and say which one's best. App votes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so there's, you know, people just naturally using the Reddit platform are actually doing their part in training an LLM. And it comes as no surprise that obviously Reddit realized that somebody went and uh, used this like massive untapped resource right out from under them. Wow. So Reddit is the genesis of ChatGPT. Yeah, in, in a sense. Yeah. Uh, and the, the funny thing is too, you know, like a few months ago we went out and we said, you know, the second Reddit did that, we said, I th we think that a lot of other companies are going to start blocking off access to their data. Because as you probably know, like data is the real moat here. Um, a lot of people yeah. can go and train an LLM, but it really depends on like the data quality you have, if you really want to have a good model. And, you know, you saw all of a sudden writ, like Twitter started blocking everything. Uh, LinkedIn made it even more difficult than it previously was uh, to scrape their data. Um, Reddit, obviously we just talked about, and there are many, many more examples. And, and now you're, you're seeing in general, the internet's probably your best database. But the problem is that it's extremely unstructured and it's very uh, siloed. So that's part of our mission is to just kind of open that up a little bit. Can you talk to me a little bit about this Oracle idea or is it still too early to, to re reveal it? No, no, I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. The idea here is that in general, oracles are something that are seen as a source of truth, right? And you might have seen, I put out like a bit of a hint that our NLP data set is going live soon. So as we're actually scraping the internet, each node is submitting proof of request to a smart contract. And uh, by doing that, you're drawing a clear relationship between a data set and the website from which it was derived. Having, having trust in, in your data is something that like we did touch on a little bit, but you can actually draw a lot of parallels between LLMs and search engines. And inevitably, as the AI ecosystem matures, it's going to go through the same ad tech cycles that search engines went through. Like in conversations with a lot of open source contributors, like people are already being um, solicited by companies saying, hey, when someone asks about makeup, make sure to put my company in here. Just put a ton of stuff in your data set that says that we're the best. Yeah. And, and at the moment, it's very easy to do that if someone wanted to uh, and it's going to happen right and, and you want to make sure that you're having a true and unbiased source of data like when, when you're not just trading a data set but actually like or sorry not just trading a model but actually using it and then there's also like the other side of this right where we're able to feed LLMs with data otherwise inaccessible to like most traditional sources um, and you know like I mentioned earlier we're playing around with GPT-4 and in real time like using Bing it can give you answers but much of the time they're incorrect uh, and our network is yeah. able to solve this quite, quite well. That's super exciting. So basically, let's, let's see if I understand correctly. You install this uh, Chrome extension in your browser and you become like a, a node that people can use to scrape the information through your computer. How do you like make sure that the data is secure or the privacy of that user is uh, maintained? Yeah, that's a 
Great, great question. We actually don't collect any personal information. Uh, fundamentally, like the only information that we actually collect is the email that you use to sign up and make your account. And, and the reason we do that is so that we can help you reset your password if you forgot how to do that and to send you communication and updates and things like that. So you make sure you don't miss anything. In general, we had to go through a very pretty intense vetting process with the uh, Google marketplace. Uh, for at, for web extensions, anyone can actually go in and like sniff the packets and see what we're doing. You can actually think of the extension as yeah, you have a driveway in front of your house that you're not using and you might as well rent out some of it. And just because someone's renting your driveway doesn't mean that they can enter your house. You're not giving them the keys to your house. You're just giving them a spark, a spot on the driveway that uh, they're paying you for. Yeah, that's a pretty cool analogy. Peak is a layer one blockchain designed to power DPINs. Why do DPINs choose to build on Peak? It's fast, scalable, low cost offer builders are ready to deploy Deepin SDK and it's multi-chain. So when you build on Peak, you're building for all Web3. Peak is home for the fastest growing Deepin projects with more than 100,000 vehicles and devices deployed, over a dozen Deepins already building and the world leading device manufacturers such as Boss partner with them. Think of building a Deepin, Peak has a grand program for Deepin builders. If you're listening to this, remember you're early. The Peak Network will launch in the first half of 2024. Check out Peak's channels for more details and links in the podcast description. You guys are owning a lot of data from the web scraping for all the users. Uh, and it's going to be, you're going to, with that data, then you can train LLMs. You can do a lot of other things as well. Uh, is that part of like the profitability of the project? How do you see that part and, and your USP as well? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So to start, we are in a sense like, owning that data, but we do plan on eventually open sourcing it and creating a community of uh, contributors who are actually able to go and request certain things and say, hey, I think, you know, as we're training an LLM together, uh, contributors can go and say, hey, I think we're missing this data set or this is underrepresented or we need more multimodal data or whatever. And then the grass network can go, can be used uh, in that, you know, for that purpose, as far as monetization goes, there are a lot of angles there. The monetization doesn't exactly come from just straight data sets. It comes from insights. So a lot of companies have very, very specific use cases and, and that's where we come in as well. Um, so we, we've already been approached by quite a few in a particular sector, which unfortunately I can't mention right now. Um, and, and what they're actually looking for is not just raw data that's being scraped from the internet, um, which is something that we do, uh, but they want a lot of the analysis that comes with it because um, they want to go and predict things. So so that's where we're, we're plugging in. You can kind of think of us as, if you're looking at it from the, if you're trying to draw a parallel to Web2, I'd look at the alternative data industry. That's awesome. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Do you guys uh, have a blockchain in mind to, to build on top of? We have one. We have a few in mind. Uh, we haven't made that decision public yet. You'll see very soon. I think people will be happy. To be honest, uh, there's so many good opportunities in different chains there. I don't think there is a one winner to take it all for deep in as well, right? How do you see like the future of, of the grass? Because like just by talking to him right now, I'm getting like goosebumps about all the possibilities <laughs> and things that can happen from this, you know, it's just, and I can see how it's just the very, very, very early beginning. Once this grows and becomes a community, people building on top and requesting things, this can be massive, uh, super excited. Why do you see the project, let's say in the next month, a year, five years from now, do you have an idea? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I do, uh, for sure. <laughs> um, so in, you know, at, at our current stage, we're building our training data set. We eventually want to focus on tooling for inference, right? Um, that's where you make the, the real Oracle uh, comparison, right? Because you get a real time data feed of correct data. Um, that's being validated. And, and that's probably within a six month time frame. But more eminently, in the next month, uh, we're launching an Android app uh, and that'll make it a lot easier. Yeah, we have a lot of users actually who don't have the capacity to run a web extension on their laptop all day. Either they have to go to work or uh, they just have some, you know, it's a work laptop in the first place, or they just don't have a laptop and they have a phone. And we think our mobile app will make this a lot easier. We have a few other integrations that I can't really talk about yet, uh, but those are coming up yeah. as well. Uh, is that Docker one of them or you can talk Absolutely. about Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we will have a containerized version of the Grass extension coming out fairly soon, probably after the uh, mobile app. But it'll allow people to go and run a Raspberry Pi so they can monetize their home Wi-Fi while they go to work, for instance. So that should be pretty cool. Um, at some point in 2024, we do plan on retroactively rewarding everyone who's contributed to the protocol to date. 
Uh, we're you know exploring several options. Uh, some of them involve rewarding users with governance rights. So stay tuned for that. Reward user with like a nice like trip to Ibiza. That would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's super cool. Cause I mean, the the Docker angle I think is quite interesting because I can imagine a lot of people deployed, for example, Helium hotspots around the world, right? The, of course, the the Helium hotspot right now, if you have a Raspberry Pi, it's way too powerful for actually the needs for just a, like a lower device, lower network. People are looking for alternatives. Okay, I can just put a, an extra container on the project, and they're gonna start becoming like a grass node as well. And imagine there was like a million devices out there right now of course around 300 and something thousand but it's still 300 something thousand devices that you can have a massive amount of nodes out of nowhere yeah uh, so, so that's super exciting a lot of the demand we've received for the containerized version actually came from users who want to uh, aggregate various deepens because they realized with a certain amount of compute and a certain amount of bandwidth one protocol will be using a lot of one but not much of the other so you can actually go and combine them into one device uh, which we think is really exciting and, and we actually quite like the fact that our protocol appeals to both user bases, if you will. Like there's like the technical side of things where a lot of users will say, hey, I'm really into setting up these like, you know, deep end validators, for instance, uh, and I'm going to combine all of them into one device and grass can be part of that. But uh, what I find similarly important is the fact that users can go and set up a grass node uh, if they wanted to, without knowing anything about the technology and without any upfront capital. Uh, like imagine trying to set up a validator for Solana or Ethereum. Like, it's extremely financially prohibitive. Uh, you need a huge breadth of knowledge technically in order to do this. And Grass is helping you monetize something that you already have. Uh, you don't have to pay anything. You just download the extension. I'm quite quite a fan of this trend within Deepin, where apps are improving the onboarding experience exponentially. Like we've come a long way in the last two two and a half years. Yes. No. Exactly. I I can say I can say the same thing. Like from two and a half three years ago until we are now was like massive amount of uh, improvements done. Uh, there's a lot of good people working like tirelessly and trying to build better networks, better decentralized infrastructure projects. Right. Uh, in all areas, uh, it's it's been really really interesting, and also we've seen uh, on Deepin like by building Deepin Hub, there's over a hundred projects that are already like starting, and I'm sure there's like hundreds that like they're still in the ideation phase, right? So I, I believe that Deepin is going to be very important in the next cycle and yeah. in the future, to be honest. Do you have anything else would you like to to tell the listeners um, or how they can get involved in the project, etc.? Yeah, yeah. I think you should use Daniel's referral code in the description of this video. Awesome. Yeah, guys, I, I'll drop the, the link on, on, on the YouTube video or in the Spotify on the podcast audio. Click there, register for the grass. Uh, and start collecting those beautiful grass points because something really, really exciting is happening. Uh, and I'm really glad to be part of it. And thank you so much, Andre, for the time, for building this project, because I think it's actually going to bring a lot of value to everybody. And let's go. Let's go.